Hi, I'm Tom Rue of the Coffin Foundation, and welcome to Top of Mind, our weekly program sharing information and news from the world of entrepreneurship. This week, we're going to revisit one of the entrepreneurs we met at Inc. 500. We're going to share some information we learned uh, while visiting the Reddit 2012 Open Internet Bus Tour. And then finally, we're going to share some interesting stories that from folks we met at Think Iowa, a new program and conference made from the good people at Silicon Prairie News. This is Top of Mind. If you watched last week, you knew that we were on location at Inc. 500 conference, where we shared with you the great story of Blake Hall, founder of TroopSwap. Well, in this week's episode, I want to share another story that we got at Inc., uh, specifically Neil Grimmer, founder of Plum Organics Baby Food. Here is a, a classic entrepreneur story where becoming a father really became the inspiration that launched his company that is now really having an impact on how baby food industry is thinking of itself and relating to its consumers. You move fast. <laughs> you try and keep up with the demand, and, um, and I think you never lose sight of what made you successful in the early days. And in our case, it was about being parents. And so I'll rewind the clock a little bit and go back to uh, you know how I kind of capture the story is how falling in love transformed dormant baby food category. So this is back in the late 90s, and I met my wife, then uh, girlfriend, Tana Johnson. And we were in the creative boom town of San Francisco. There was dot com parties every night and then pink slip parties every other night. And I was working as a designer at IDEO, a design and innovation firm, working on a lot of food and beverage projects at the time. And, uh, you know, and at the time, you know, Tan and I, what we really connected on was our food values. We were both organic, both into sustainable uh, eating and eating locally back in the day. And, um, and all of a sudden, you know, we were having a lot of fun, probably too much fun, and all of a sudden, boy meets girl turned to it's a girl. And, uh, and we found ourselves careening towards parenthood um, very rapidly. So, you know, going from hanging out in bars to hanging out in baby showers, shopping at Bloomingdale's to shopping at Babies R Us. And, uh, and, and quite frankly, being a designer and a dad, those two brought together saw massive opportunity and, and quite frankly, massive gaps in what my wife and I were looking for as it related to, you know, very convenient but also ultra healthy food for our little ones. And so that was kind of the genesis of why we started the company. Well, one, one of the things about the baby food category, which is really interesting, is that it hasn't seen innovation for quite a while. And so when, when a category is starved of innovation, what ends up happening is it becomes about low price leadership. And so this, this entire category has had a race to the bottom. Glass jar baby food is trading at 59 cents a glass jar. Um, very little margin for brands and even less margin for retailers with a, quite frankly, a suboptimal product that you know parents receive because of that of that dynamic, and um, and so I think it was probably with a little bit of naivete and a, a little bit of of hope that we said, hey, we're going to bring super premium ingredients into a category, into a super premium and also super convenient package, and bring things like purple carrot, quinoa, Greek yogurt into the baby food category, and uh, and we're going to rethink the way that parents relate to the glass jar in terms of the pricing demands and um, and also you know hope that retailers would have you know accepted a promise so our product costs a dollar 49 versus a 59 cent glass jar of baby food and, and that's largely just because we said we're not going to trade down on ingredients we're going to bet only the best ingredients and put them into this product for for little ones the most precious consumers we have so we certainly wish Neil Grimmer much success in disrupting the baby food industry Coming back a little closer to home, we were host to the Reddit 2012 Open Internet Bus Tour, where Reddit founder Alexis Ohanian sat down with a panel of local entrepreneurs, and they were given a chance to share their stories and help us grow an understanding of why an open and free internet is important to the startup community uh, for the country that's really going to be driving the economy. Uh, but tonight's panel is about the future of entrepreneurship. And I've had the privilege of doing entrepreneurship since college, so it's literally all I know. And I, uh, <laughs> I could not have done it if it weren't for an open internet. That was the reason why I got involved, uh, because Steve Huffman and I never could have started Reddit, and you all could never have that as a way to share cute cat photos if 
either of those laws were in place. So we've got some entrepreneurs here who aren't just doing things that involve you wasting your time at work. And that's what makes the future of entrepreneurship so exciting for me. All right, because the internet just makes the world more efficient. As more people get connected, as supply meets demand, all of these marketplaces that used to be invisible are now getting connected. And the kinds of businesses, the kinds of industries that are being disrupted and created are vast. As Mark Andreessen said recently in an op-ed, code software is eating the world, all right? And that software is primarily running on the internet. And it's not just a series of tubes, it's not just a big truck. Uh, it's something our politicians need to know about. Because the future of entrepreneurship, and frankly, I think the future of the American economy, rests in us making the right decisions right now. We know what a big deal entrepreneurship is here in this country. So much of the, the American spirit, so much of that is tied into this notion of entrepreneurship. But a lot has changed since uh, a few hundred years ago when this whole thing got started in the way of technology. Specifically, how, how is the internet, how is this connected mature web that we're in right now, how is this making what you're doing possible? How is that free flow of data making this possible in a way that you know, even 15 or 20 years ago just could not have happened? We'll just go right down the road. Well, I guess it goes without saying we wouldn't be around doing what we're doing without the internet as an internet-based uh, civic crowdfunding platform. The internet enables the flow of uh, cash through Neighborly to help cities and citizens pay for you know, civic projects. Uh, without the internet, there's none of that. But there's also none of us and, and our backgrounds and our experiences uh, learning how to program using uh, internet resources, um, chatting with others on the internet uh, around the world who we would never otherwise have access to, uh, experts in all manner of subject areas. Um, so we wouldn't exist, we'd be a non-starter. And real quick question, I, no, I was eavesdropping. You guys have recently, uh, you just had your latest project funded where? Oh, thank you. Uh, we actually just went national about 45 minutes ago. Uh, you hear that? We just went national 45 minutes ago. It's like... <laughs> Thank you. Uh, a, uh, the first one is a skate park in Portland, Oregon, so we can't and, wait to get out there. And really, real quick, how long ago did you start the company? Three months. And that too, uh, that, that pace of innovation also would, wouldn't happen without the internet there to accelerate every aspect of what we do. So. And, and real quick, how much, uh, what was your advertising strategy to get the word out in Oregon? Like how much money did you spend and what, what means of advertising did you use? Uh, zero dollars, it was a, a blog. Somebody wrote a blog and this uh, person contacted us through a blog, I think so. The media are everywhere and everyone. Awesome, all right. <laughs> so uh, um, I think for me, I like to tell a story about guitar makers because we make cars and cars are sometimes really hard for people to understand. They drive them, but they don't know how to make them. And uh, so a guitar is a little bit inter a little bit more simple. It's a physical device that's complex to a uh, straight fretboard. You know, you uh, grab the keys. Uh, uh, and you can make notes with it. Most people have seen these things. And so a guitar maker in the 1800s looks like somebody passing along his craft by standing next to a young person and saying, this is how you make a guitar. And funny enough, a guitar today is, when passed down as information, is the same thing. It's two people standing next to each other and me saying, this is how you make a guitar. But the difference that is so fundamental between the 1800 guitar maker and the guitar maker today is not that the machines that they use to make the guitar are any different or better. It really has nothing to do with the machines and it has everything to do with the fact that in the 1800s, you would sketch out on a piece of paper how you make a guitar when you were trying to translate the information. And today, it is inherently different because you put that information into a digital format and pass it along to somebody else and that makes all the difference in the world. Everything is shareable, everything is learnable, everything is tweakable and moddable, and now somebody across the world can make a guitar much like you make a guitar without having to stand next to you. That makes all the difference in the world has been enabled by the internet. And then on top of that, we've had compounded the issue that you can go to market with your modified guitar and sell it to somebody else in another place in the world, all because of the internet. So for physical products, it has changed the way in which we make them and mod them. And uh, whether it's guitars or cars or cows and the way in which you raise them or make them uh, um, work for the customer, the internet has changed the way in which we do commerce. Real quick. 
is there a local motors for guitars? Because you've given me an idea. There we go. Uh, I believe, that's a great question. I believe for complex physical devices, in fact, the more complex and the more mysterious that they are, the more likely you are to have communities come together and open hardware creation and make them better. So that's a great huh. idea. Yeah, but please someone run with that. Just give me, when you become a billionaire, just send me a note and say, hey, thanks. Um, that's, see, but this is, I feel like you all especially have, <laughs> it's, it's really impressive when, and we see this often on Reddit, when, when you see a disparate group of people kind of all over the world getting together about something, they rally behind something, and sometimes really impressive stuff comes out of it. Um, but to date, they haven't yet made a car. Like, the fact that you guys have proven this model works for manufacturing a car is pretty awesome. Uh, and it makes everything else, it makes the guitar actually seem pretty accessible. Don't know how big the market is, but that's for you guys to figure out. Thank you. So for me, I think it's, yeah, it's interesting because I think it's about access. So you look at software um, and the cost of building software now on the internet going so far down and then the scalability of software due to the ubiquity of software. So you mentioned uh, Mark's famous blog about software in the world. So they said software eats meat when they invested into ag local. And I think it's very true because what you can do with software now versus what you could even do 10 years ago means that you can create these marketplaces where access is available where it wasn't available before. So in the case of Ag Local, you've got this imbalance where on one side you've got these huge commodities, and on the other side you've got all these makers. And so people don't typically look at farmers as makers, you know. And uh, so you take the Etsy model and some of the other models that facilitate makers competing against some of the larger uh, distributed businesses. And the internet has this unique ability to provide access between a, a, you know, a maker and a buyer while still maintaining the connection and maintaining some of the profit margin. So we felt for Ag Local, the ability to use the internet at scale with, with the cost being so low to develop these apps now, it, it really was an advantage. It really didn't exist 10 years ago. So. so as software eats the farm, or at least as Ag Local software eats the farming world, then we as consumers get to eat all of the wonderful stuff right, from man. the farming world. Um, quick question, this was, in, this was something I learned on the bus tour. What percentage of farms that make all the wonderful food that we eat are um, family owned? 98% of those farms are family owned. Did you guys all hear that? 98%? 98% of those farms are family owned. That's, that's right. Cra like, that's right. Get, I, yeah, that's, that, that number blew me away. Um, and as someone who, uh, who, who enjoys some delicious barbecue, knowing that 98% of the farms right now are not the giant mega corps that are at least plugged in, that are these family farms that are competing with an uneven playing field and you guys are offering software to get them on a level one is, it's, it's disruptive. Thank you. And delicious. It is delicious. <laughs> it's a fun business to work in for sure. <laughs> All right, please. I think the biggest thing um, the internet has taught us uh, in this economy today, it's, it's not just about uh, open, it's also about sharing. And you look at a company like Leap2 and what we are doing and what other search companies are doing, and at its core, we have no business if people are not willing to share their information. And I think that, to me, is a very powerful um, thing and, and you think about the metaphor of this part of the country uh, many years ago and the fact that there was a land grab um, and you think about the revolution we're going on today with the internet this is our revolution it's not a land grab it's a land share and I think that's a very powerful thing that uh, of course we all should always respect um, and I think about with uh, with leap two um, I, I always use this example, and I just love it. We have a fishing lake out in western Kansas um, that my father loves to go to, and he doesn't even know what, you know, really Twitter is. And I showed him, I said, Dad, you know, you can go and you can search on our app and check this out. So it, it took him to, um, of course, a website on, the, on Lake Wilson, but it also took him to a, a result in the social side that basically talked about this guy, this was in August, and the advice was you need to fish at 40 foot of water to catch the walleye. And this was at very high heat. And I think about, you know, in my world, that's awesome. And I have to respect that as somebody that's in information retrieval and it's that, that sharing. I mean, none of this is possible without all of that. So. so as the Reddit bus tour made its way on to Danville, Kentucky, 
we headed north to Des Moines, Iowa to participate in this year's Think Iowa. Think Iowa is a conference put on by Silicon Prairie News. Silicon Prairie News, for those of you who don't know, is a newer media company that's really covering the exciting activities that are happening in the startup communities of Omaha, Des Moines, and now Kansas City. We're very excited to have them covering Kansas City, and you're going to be hearing and reading a lot more from Silicon Prairie News. But at the conference itself, we were front row center for many of the exciting speakers. One in particular was AOL co-founder Steve Case, who really spoke on the importance of supporting you know, startup communities and startups in general. Uh, of particular interest, however, in his message was that this is a long play. This is not for short sound bites and a short-term exit, but in fact, these are investments in our communities that, if done properly, with the patience of a long view, will pay dividends for generations to come. Let's change gears a little bit for the entrepreneurs in our audience. With, with your company, you've invested in companies like Zipcar, Living Social, Exclusive Resource, et cetera. Um, what are some of the consistent threads in the companies that you choose to invest in? Well, we are, we, we're a little bit different than, than uh, some uh, investors because we, we tend to do a relatively small number of things and then spend more time on them. There are some investors who like to do a lot of things and have more of a portfolio thing. We're, we're a little bit more, quite, quite a bit more selective. So we'll make a handful of investments each year, not, not, uh, not dozens. So therefore, you know, we really need to believe in the entrepreneur and believe in the idea and particularly believe that the entrepreneur is trying to create a change the world company with a longer term built to last orientation. There are actually a lot of entrepreneurs that are in for kind of a quick flip, kind of a, you know, they're building companies with the explicit idea of selling them to Google or somebody two years later. That's fine, then, you know, that creates innovation, creates jobs, creates you know, economic growth, that's fine. But we're much more interested in not the built-to-flip companies, but the built-to-last companies. Also on the docket at Think Iowa was Brad Feld, who was promoting his new book on startup communities and where he shared lessons he learned on what he called the Boulder Phenomenon. Uh, Brad, for those of you who don't know, is founder of Techstars, one of the best known and most successful accelerators in the country. And the lessons that he shares, namely around what he calls leaders and feeders, is a lesson that many communities might want to consider as they struggle towards or work on uh, promoting an entrepreneurial ecosystem and culture of their own. Um, but this group of us, which included me, were excited about being connected to each other and about connecting more entrepreneurs to each other and starting to build something in Boulder versus what, what existed at the time was you know, a number of entrepreneurial activities, but a very diffuse construct, a very diffuse sense of community, a lot of biases. When I moved to Boulder, everybody said, oh, you can't get a company funded here, you have to go to the Bay Area. Now, Boulder's got a lot of techies, but it's got no management, it's got no salespeople. That's an easily solvable problem if you have a 20-year view. Boulder has no uh, venture capital. Well, no, some Boulder still has very little venture capital. Boulder's too small, it's 100,000 people. So what? That turned that into an advantage. So there are all these things that these entrepreneurs recognized were easily overcomable and from a leadership perspective. Today, if you look at the Boulder startup community, 75, 100 entrepreneurs who play leadership roles on a continual basis. So the critical mass doesn't have to be 100 on day one, it can be five on day one. But those five have to commit to number two, this 20-year journey. And the reason I say it's a 20-year journey is I think of it as a generational phenomenon. And in a more sophisticated conversation after we've had the conversation the first time and somebody starts challenging me, why 20 years, why not 15 years, why not 27 years? My response is actually it's 20 years from today. And in a year, it's still 20 years. And in five years, it's still 20 years. So the bolder dynamic today is 20 years from now. And so the conversation about how we do it happens in 2032, not in 12, 2013. And so you have to have Thanks for joining us on the road this week. Look forward to seeing you next week on Top of Mind.